feel like this must be like the call an actor waits for. What is it like to get an audition, an offer to join the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Sure. I, it was a pretty blind experience, I have to say. I mean, I got an audition and the subject line just said something like audition for untitled Marvel project number four. And the audition scene that I had to tape was an approximation of the scene that you see in the show, but with no identifying details, no real specificity to dig into. It was just a sort of outline version of what it actually ended up being. And so, you know, there's not a ton to dig into there and you do your best and for some reason, I can't remember why I was on a little bit of a time crunch. And so it was an audition tape that I made in my apartment in New York City. My best friend read the other lines and I had to send it off really fast. And I woke up the next morning after I had sent it off feeling really ashamed of myself. I felt like it wasn't good enough. I can be really hard on myself and I'm working on that. But oh, um Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> it's life's work, probably. But but I woke up the next day feeling a little like that was such a great opportunity, and you might have blown it. And um, and you know went went along with my life and tried to forget about it. And then about a month later, out of the blue, I got an email that said we have an offer for Untitled Marvel Project Number Four, which is a little bit rare. Usually, you get some sort of preliminary heads up that, hey, you're in the final three for this thing, or we're expecting an offer, we're just not sure when. And there was nothing. I sent that tape, I felt terrible about myself. And then about a month later, fully out of the blue, um, I got that offer. And it was, it was really, really exciting. And, you know, it's always flattering when someone wants to hire you for their for their project, but it was so shrouded in mystery still that um, it was funny to feel like I'm excited, but I'm not 100% sure what exactly I'm excited about. I don't totally know if this is a film. I don't know if it's a series. I sort of assumed I had been cast in WandaVision because I did some Googling and um, Matt Shackman, who directed that series, runs the Geffen Playhouse in Los Angeles. And I've over the years almost done a couple plays there. And so the the story I concocted for myself was that I made that tape, it crossed Matt's desk, and he went, oh, I kind of know who that is, I'll hire him. And um, turns out I was dead wrong. <laughs> it wasn't until I got my script pages, actually, that, you know, a week or so later, maybe I was emailed the official materials for this role, and I responded to that person and just said, I'm so sorry, is there anything you can tell me what show this is or any, are there any details you can tell me? Because I truly know nothing. And um, they sent me back, you know, this is the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. It's being directed by Kari Skogland. Um, and so it was um, a slow, steady process of learning <laughs> what I had gotten myself into. Were you familiar with any of the, of the world of uh, of this comic book, the mythology, anything about, anything like that? No, I was, you know, 1% familiar with the Marvel <laughs> Cinematic Universe. I had seen Black Panther, which I thought was amazing. I had seen one of the Avengers films in the theater because it was really hot in New York City that day and I wanted to sit in some air conditioning. And I always, I mean, I, I always had a real appreciation for it when I would see those films it's unbelievable what they're able to do. But I, I think I felt intimidated by just how much history there was. And I can be a little bit of a completist and I don't want to jump in in the middle on something. And so I think, you know, I know so many people during this quarantine time that have watched all of the films and series in order. And I think there's part of me that maybe felt like, you know, until I can do that, why would I go see one of the films when I don't really know who these characters are. And um, so, yeah, I, I was really not familiar with much of it. And so I was, I felt like I was sort of like parachuting in 
to a whole new acting planet or something. Wow. And on this new acting planet, because to me, you know, the scene does feel not just grounded in comic book fiction, but in like spy thriller kind of stuff, action kind of stuff. Were there any sort of non-comic book genre touchstones or, or even performances that you were drawing from in this character? That's such a good question. Um, I don't really think that there were because I thought the script was so clear and rich and gave so much history and gave so many things to sort of fill out for myself when he, he you know, he, he um, says a lot about what he's been through and where he's been and what he's seen and what he's worked on. And really every one of those little sentences can send you down a rabbit hole of what was that like? What did that feel like? What did, um, you know, what were his opinions on those people? And, um, and so I think I mostly just tried to use that as my guide. And, um, you know, I had, a, I had an acting teacher when I was really young say, your script is your treasure map. And I think about that all the time. And I think this is such a good example of that because really every single thing you can ask questions about. And, and that's so much fun for me getting ready to shoot something. And so I think I really mostly focused on that. I didn't have any, you know, I didn't even know that I was sort of following in line with Stanley Tucci until I was basically there shooting it because also it's not a short scene. And so as soon as I, I got the official script pages just a couple of days before I was going to start shooting. And so I felt like the number one through 10 priorities were just to memorize all of that speaking, because the last thing you want when you show up on set is to be worried about what you're supposed to say. And so I, I think, I, I think I felt like I had my work cut out for me in that department. And so I didn't have a ton of time to, um, you know, to even like go watch what Stanley had done. And so when you get to set, you've got the lines memorized. You're working with Kari, with Anthony, with Sebastian. What is that vibe on set like? Does it feel like you're impeding on a family dinner or do they welcome you with open <laughs> arms? What is the vibe like? That's such a good way of putting the impeding on a family dinner is such a good way of putting what it can feel like to show up. You know, I've done a lot of guest starring. I've done a lot of recurring parts doing two episodes of this thing, three episodes of that thing. And um, you never really know what you're getting yourself into. Um, you can show up and the set could be a very tense environment or you can show up and everyone's having a blast and you just never know. And, and a big part of the work of being a guest star is just sort of rolling with whatever is there. And it can feel like you're jumping on board a moving train. You don't know what the train will look like or feel like, or if the people will be nice to you, but you sort of have to jump on and try to not attract too much attention and behave as if you've been there all along. Um, and especially with something that felt as massive as a Marvel show, you could, potentially envision a world in which it is sort of impersonal and corporate and just like a big machine. But I'm so happy to report that really every single person treated me like I was family that had been there the whole time. There was no, you know, it really didn't feel for one second, like this is kind of our thing. And yeah, you're here for a couple of days, but like, it's mainly about us. Like they really with open arms made me feel, um, made me feel like I was family and that, you know, that does happen from time to time, but it doesn't happen most of the time. And for it to happen on something so massive was really surprising and genuinely moving to me. And maybe this is true in every line of work that the jobs that are special to you are special because of the people that are there and this always would have been an exciting job no matter what but the reason that it feels special to me is because those people are so wonderful and went so far out of their way 
to really make me feel like I was part of it. I was really blown away by it. It was not what I was anticipating. That's wonderful to hear. Um, the scene itself, you know, it's you, Sebastian, Anthony, and Daniel. It's very intense. <laughs> and yet when I watch it with your performance, there does seem to be a sense of like, of play, of almost like a gallo sense of humor. <laughs> it's like a little off the beaten path for what you might expect from this kind of scene. And I'm curious if that was something y'all discovered while rehearsing the scene, if there was a level of like improvisation, spontaneity, what was it like crafting this dynamic with your scene partners? Yeah, I think that we had the luxury of time and that we shot that sequence over maybe three or four days. I can't totally remember. Whereas most television shows and films would go, it's one location, we can slam through that before lunch. Or we can only devote, you know, two thirds of a day to something like that. And so we had the luxury of time. And I think what that really gave us was the ability to try a lot of different versions of Dr. Wilfred Nagel. And, you know, we did takes where he was very sort of numb and passive. We did takes where he was terrified of what might be about to happen to him with these guys waving guns in his face and throwing him up against walls. We did versions where he had a little bit of a sense of humor. Um, and I feel like I really give credit to Kari and the editing team for putting together a performance that, um, that yeah, I, I'm, I'm so happy to hear you say that it doesn't just feel like a person throwing out a bunch of exposition. You do want to, obviously I'm the actor playing it. I want it to feel like a full person and um, a person who has a lot of complex layers and a history. And, um, and I think a lot of that, again, I think is because we had time and we weren't rushed and we were able to go, actually, great, we have that version. Why don't we try something different? Or let's see what happens if he responds to this in this way. And because I really do think your job as an actor on a TV set or on a film set is to give your director and your editor options. It's not useful for them to have five takes that look the exact same. And so it also was a little bit of a mystery to me before I saw the episode, you know, what exactly will the character be in the end? And again, I, th I think that that goes back to the comfort that I felt with those people and how welcoming they were. I've heard stories from a lot of other Marvel TV shows and a lot of other Marvel films that I think a lot of people have that experience when working in the MCU. And then I think it's not an accident that those kinds of atmospheres create stories that people find compelling and interesting and that keep fans coming back for more and more because when you're comfortable at work, you're able to do work that is hopefully interesting and exciting. And um, yeah, I mean, that might be circling back to your previous question a little bit, but yeah, I, I'm a, the short answer to the question is that we had time and that enabled us to play around and see, feel like we had explored all the different possibilities. That's wonderful. Um, let's dive a little bit into the the treasure map, so to speak. The the, mm -hmm. the the nuggets of like MCU intrigue in the script. Your character went through the blip. He he turned to friggin' dust. <laughs> uh, did you talk about think about Stu on what that could have felt like? What does it feel like to be blipped? What does it feel like after? Did you think about that psychologically? I think the main thing that I thought about is what it must feel like to be so close to achieving what you think is your highest purpose and have that disappear. He was so close to accomplishing what he had worked for for so long and, um, and then had to pick right back up as soon as he showed up again and um and i think the 
the horror of that and the frustration of that and the heartbreak of that is sort of what I focused on in that because, you know, he was the only person on the planet that we're aware of that was able to maybe reconstruct this serum and, um, and to feel like you're dangerously close and have it all ripped away from you. You know, now at the end of, hopefully at the end of this hardcore lockdown year that we've all been through, now I feel like my performance might be a little richer <laughs> then I we we shot I shot my part of the series pre coronavirus, and um, it's funny to think about now. I really know what it feels like to, you know, be locked in one location for a long time and terrified for your life. And um, you know, may, maybe now my performance would be calibrated a little bit differently, or feel like it's coming from a slightly deeper place, having gone through what we've all gone through. Do you think physically, physiologically, that being quote unquote in the blip is similar to quote unquote being in quarantine? What does it feel like to to be in this weird Thanos dust limbo? Yeah, I, I truly, I don't know that I have a great answer. I would be so interested to know other people's theories and feelings. The quarantine it feels to me more related to um, Dr. Nagel, I think, being sort of like trapped in this shipping crate lab that is probably also his home that he feels like he can't leave. I do think he feels like he's under constant threat or that, you know, anyone could find him and kill him at any time. And, um, and you know, th those feelings feel potentially not that different from what we've all been through for a little while now. So speaking of constant threat... Your character works explicitly with a figure known as the Power Broker. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take a guess and say you cannot tell me who the Power Broker is. That's a really good guess. Also, because I don't know. I so, was wondering about that. They, they I didn't cannot tell, tell you up. in a lot of for, for a lot of different reasons. I cannot <laughs> tell you. I'm also not convinced that Doctor Nagel knows. Oh, interesting. I I think it's possible that someone like the power broker would communicate through intermediary sources or through, you know, I watched a lot of Homeland in my day, like communicate through various, like, you know, you'll see a can on this corner and there will be a message in it or something like that. I don't know that Dr. Nagel has direct communication with the power broker. I don't know that anybody does. Yeah. But that might just be something fun I invented for myself in my script analysis. Well, that's, I mean, that was something I was wondering. I, I kind of had a feeling they wouldn't necessarily tell you. And I was wondering what the process is for an actor to imply such a kind of loaded, emotionally fraught relationship with someone who you as a performer literally don't know who it is, but you as a character kind of need to know who it is. What, how, do you, how do you achieve that balance? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that when you're working with people like Kari and Zoe, the producer from Marvel who was on set, who is wonderful, I think you can really trust that they will give you all the information you need and they won't let anything happen in terms of like continuity of the performance or the, like, like no ball will be dropped because they're so thorough and they're so clear in their vision. And so... I do feel like I was able to sort of come up with some ideas of my own and explore different pathways that felt possible to me with the knowledge that no one on this set is going to let me go too far away from what it needs to be. And, um, and I think also as an actor, sometimes it's just in your best interest to decide that you have everything you need. And I think that I could use the feeling that I don't totally know who the power broker is. I have a sense of the stakes of who that person might be. I have a sense of their impact on my particular story. But maybe Dr. Wilfred Nagel doesn't know who they are either. That's interesting. And, you know, you're a better actor when you're not acting. 
And so if I, the actor don't totally know, is there a way that the character might not know either? And I think that you can make a compelling case for that here. That makes a lot of sense. Um, You have like kind of a bit of an action oriented exit from the series. (laughs) Sure. And I am just curious procedure wise, and I guess psychologically wise, speaking too, what is it like as an actor to get shot, to fall backward in a chair, and then to get blown the hell up <laughs> as an exit on a television show? What an exit. I mean, if you know, if if the gunshot doesn't kill you, an explosion probably will. Probably. Um and that chair hitting the ground, you know, you're concussed at least. Sure, absolutely. Right. It's a metal floor. So um yeah, I mean, I'm so happy to report that every single thing felt unbelievably safe. And I felt like I was in such great hands with that stunt team and the effects team. Um, and so I felt like, again, it's it's so rare to have an experience where you feel like every single person in every department is at the top of their game. and. I've done some stunts on other sets that have not felt 100% great. And um, I think, unfortunately, a lot of actors have not exactly horror stories, but stories in which you don't feel fully comfortable or stories where something feels like it's sort of thrown together at the last minute and you have to hope for the best. And um, there was literally none of that here. Again, because there's time, they had the time to not rush an explosion and really sort of talk through when do these guns show up and how exactly are they fired and when exactly are they fired and does everybody have earplugs? And um, an amazing thing about working for a producer like Marvel also is that they have a long history now of unbelievably intricate sequences. And for them, someone being shot and an explosion is actually pretty small on the scale of the kinds of things that they've executed beautifully for a long time. And so, again, I mean, I I really feel like I was able to just give over and trust all of these people no matter their department or their job. And that's so, I'm so thankful. And I was really, um, again, you, you, don't, you don't know what you're getting yourself into when you show up for a couple of days to shoot something. And it was, it was just thrilling to me to get to feel like, okay, I trust all of these people. So we'll, we'll make it happen. And make it happen you did. Um, we're just about out of time. Just one Hail Mary question for you. We did just talk at length about how your character pretty explicitly dies. Sure. But this is, you know, it's the MCU. We've got What If coming up, which is all kinds of alternate realities. Comic book continuities can change. Is there any chance of Dr. Nagel coming back in some multiverse as some zombie? Has anyone talked to you about that? No one has talked to me about it, certainly. Um... But I do have hopes and dreams. I, you know, I think there's no character actor alive that doesn't love and look up to someone like Stanley Tucci. And so to follow in his footsteps in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I would love nothing more than some sort of encounter with him. Hmm. And, um, you know, I thought WandaVision was so amazing. And Catherine Hahn has been one of my favorite actors for decades now and so some sort of dr wilford nagel and agatha situation would feel like all my dreams had come true (laughs) so i i I have my own fantasies as an actor but um but i also feel like if this is the only time in my career and in my life that i encountered the marvel cinematic universe it was dreamy from top to bottom and so i'm so thankful and i never would have anticipated that something like this would happen and so 
I would be thrilled if there was more, but, um, you know, it's already more than <laughs> I ever could have dreamed of. So, you know, I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed, but they've, they've got a lot of characters to manage. So they've got, uh, they've got a few, I suppose. Yeah. It, I mean, it's a whole universe. So, Oh, that's why they call it that. Yeah. Good point. Right. <laughs>